Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at filmmakeru.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker U. Uh, every week, we interview film professionals to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by cinematographer Lal Crawley, whose work includes The OA, Black Mirror, and White Noise, just to name a few. Welcome to the show, Lal. Thank you very much. It's lovely to love to be here. Now, I have I have to ask you. I noticed that uh, in your bio, you mentioned uh, you've earned a Haskell Wexler Award for Best Cinematography. Uh, can you tell me about that? Because I, I, you know, Medium Cool is a very cool movie, <laughs> um, and I just want to know, you know, what is this award and and how did you go about yeah. winning it? Oh, interesting. Okay, so that was um, I shot a film called uh, On the Ice, which um, which was Andrew uh, McLean's uh, debut feature. It came out of the Sundance um, Lab. Um, we shot it in Barrow, Alaska. Um, it was actually based on a short film that Andrew directed um, that Kerry Fukunaga DP'd. So that, that was that's going back a little right. bit. Um, uh, I think we shot the film in 2010. It's like 12 years ago now in uh, in in uh, in Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost town in the U.S. It's officially in the Arctic Circle. Um, we shot on film. And it was sort of minus 40 degrees. We shot out on the open ocean. I was at, at three months up there. It was a hell of an experience. And um, it went to the Woodstock Film Festival in upstate New York. And um, and there was a Haskell Wexler Award for Cinematography. I, um, I have the award in the house here. And it's, uh, I think because of the sort of um, the upstate agricultural, woodsy, rural vibe. The award is kind of like a piece of plow or sort of agricultural machinery. Um, it's a really heavy object. Um, yeah, it's a, it's the mo- probably the most intriguing looking award I've ever, I've ever been lucky enough to receive. But that, okay. that, was, the set, that was essentially what it was. I'm going to interrupt this interview for one second. We want to thank Pixelview, one of our sponsors. They're a streaming solution for filmmakers. Pixelview lets you stream your work to remote clients for easy collaboration, and it works with both on-set teams and post-production teams. With built-in video chat, you can discuss and make changes in real time and stream directly from your editing software. Or you can use the hardware encoder to stream from DaVinci Resolve or the camera on set. See the promo code and the link in the video description below. I got to know, what was it like shooting in the North and like in the Arctic Circle? Because so I um, I knew a cinematographer who had to shoot up there on film and they always kept a, a Bolex with them because yeah. their gears would freeze. Yeah. Um, was it similar? Like what what was the experience like trying to shoot up there? Yeah, well, we um, we were lucky enough to shoot on film and a package was sort of gifted to us as part of uh, part of an award um, that Andrew had won. Um, so we actually had a G2, I think it was, um, which is quite a heavy, older, heavier Panavision camera, considering we were also doing a lot of handheld work. Um, so it, it was it was tough, you know, uh, but but the, one of the reasons for um, shooting on film was that they they had always historically film cameras had been more robust in low you know extreme extreme temperatures hot or cold um so as long as you winterize the the mechanism the movement within the camera which is essentially um putting oil in there that can that can uh, cope with lower has a low lower mm-hmm. freezing temperature, then you know you're you're in a better position than you are with shooting digital. I mean, this is 12 years ago, so it might be that the newer uh, Sony Venices and uh, Alexas and Reds might might have solved that problem. But yeah, I mean, it was it was pretty crazy. We were out on the frozen ocean. I was filming a sort of fight between these two young uh, Inupiat um, uh, actors. And, uh, 
you know, I'm handheld and as, and and basically as a long case, we had to put the, the batteries in a, in a cooler, mm -hmm. not to keep them cool, but to insulate them against the cold as much as we could. And, and this weighed a lot. So as I'm moving around with the camera handheld, I've got about three or four grips and camera systems behind me, all trying to stay out of shot whilst wrangling this large cooler with batteries. So it was, yeah, it was, it was pretty, uh, for, a, for a, a very dramatic sequence, it was a fairly comical uh, scene <laughs> behind, the, behind the lens. Yeah, I just remember he was like, whatever you do, don't take your glove off and touch the camera. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> like, you, you won't be getting your hand back. So. I know it was, uh, I, you know, we suffered from frostbite and had to had to be wary of um, be on the lookout for polar bears that were roaming that would that would come into close to the town because of the trash dumps and things like that. It was a pretty, uh, yeah, it was a pretty um, exciting and uh, um, yeah, dramatic landscape and uh, extreme, extreme environment to film in. Well, and I do want to get to white noise, uh, but I do have one other thing I want to ask you about. You're currently working in pre-production on The Brutalist. That's right. And is that, because like, there's not much about it online. Is that about the architecture architect who created Brutalism or is it uh, just a story about an architect in general. It's a story about uh, it's, it's a story about um, a Hungarian um, a Hungarian Jewish architect who leaves um, leaves Hungary uh, after the Second World War uh, to seek a new life and career in America. And uh, he is yes, he's a he is a uh, a brutalist architect. Not the not yeah. the, you know not, he's one of one of a number. But yeah. yes, essentially that's um yeah that's his uh, that's his story. So yeah. so when you start projects like this, do you uh, do you dive deep into things like are you studying architecture right now to get to understand it, or do you find that you like to sort of be you know surprised by what people bring you like the director and the set designer and stuff well this this will be my third film for brady corbet first one was a film called child the childhood of a leader the second one was um called vox lux um when we wrapped vox lux in in uh, new york the the day we wrapped the final evening the final shot walking away brady came up to me with a a book on brutalist architecture and presented it to me and said, this is what we're doing next. It's very rare that you'll have such a relationship with the director that they will do that. Even after you've shot, you know, a number of movies with them, one hopes that's always the case, but you know, sometimes it's like, Oh, well, you know, let's see, hopefully we'll do the next. <laughs> yeah. And, and he's a, he's a, Brady is a very dear friend and, I, I produce some of my best work with Brady for sure. Um, so I'm, I'll jump at the chance. Um, in answer to your question, uh, so that was a, that was a, you know, a, a jumping off point or my introduction to, to brutalist architecture in a sense, although I, I was aware of it. Um, uh, interestingly, yes, I've, I've definitely examined and, and looked um, Brady and I have looked together. We've been developing this for a number of years, so um, together. Um, so yeah, we've been discussing brutal architecture. I, I have to say, when it comes to the actual, uh, the actual, you know, obviously the building of of of, of the structures, etc. I mean, so much of that comes down to what Brady and the production designer are um, are sort of concocting together. But absolutely, I like to be in the mix as early as possible so that you know if we're designing a large set which in this case we are that i can actually contribute to that and um be able to sort of um uh have some control over the light and and have some input on and and some thoughtful um Com, you know, some thoughtful comments and conversations to be had about how the light is going to behave in these spaces. So there's nothing more frustrating, really, than sort of being a, being presented with a fait accompli, whether it's a location or a, a you know, or, or, a, or a, a set build and thinking, oh, you know, I really wish I'd got involved a little earlier in, uh, you know, um, 
because you know with the best will in the world directors and designers aren't always thinking about the the lighting and the problems or opportunities that that the lighting might um present well <laughs> i remember uh when i went to university i was in a, an architecture class and they were talking about brutalism and then all of a sudden they had a picture of my high school up <laughs> and i was like oh, oh yeah <laughs> oh, thank you. you had a really early uh, yeah yeah introduction to it i was like oh there we go um no i find it i find it interesting that you talk about like how does the light how is the light going to act i guess mm -hmm. is sort of what you said do you like to try and sort of i guess let the light dictate how you're going to light or do you like to be controlling of the light like try to sort of manipulate the light uh, to do what you want i i came from a background of sort of non-actors um and this is going back to sort of like post university and, and 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 um and the reason i got the first film which was ballast um uh, the reason i got to shoot that first film was because i had a i had a sort of grounding in available light non actors a kind of european sensibility like darden brothers uh, hmm. films um uh lars von trier breaking the waves of you know handheld available light not reliant on lighting um so uh, to answer that question, um, even though my career has sort of evolved in different ways and my, you know, um, I've never, I, I haven't necessarily wanted to sort of be a one trick pony or, or repeat myself. So I've been exploring different ways of lighting and, um, you know, uh, however, when I, when I come onto a project, if I'm shooting in real locations or even um, a location in which a set is going to be built. I really love to study the light and I like to do that on my own where possible. So through the process of pre-production, you'll choose these locations. And once you really feel that this location is locked, I will ask the, the location manager if I can go in, spend, you know, have access throughout the day um, and just really see what the light's doing. And I'll really try and lean into that, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's assuming i mean my my go to is to have a fairly naturalistic approach to my photography um we we can talk about a deviation from that specifically in white noise but because because that's my sort of go to i do like to be informed by naturalism and i, and I like to i i think it's interesting i think there there are um christopher doyle the cinematographer who i i, I really um responded to um at the start of my career he said he said in uh, in western cinema you say um here's the frame how do you fill it and in asian cinema eastern cinema you say here's the world how do i frame it and i was always kind of i was definitely drawn to the to the the second the idea that the world is there and you're responding to it and i i think it's kind of interesting like this i've never i've never been a fan of the idea of imposition of having total control where you're like okay this is my vision and i will impose it upon this film yes i have a vision and yes i have ideas i'm not so vague about my approach but i also think it's so important to be really open to the possibilities of what of, of of the world presenting itself so a, an accident or a, the the light falling this way and actually seeing that um that that for me is more intriguing than having complete control if i was to make a comparison within stills photography it would almost be sort of gregory crudson versus todd hedo gregory crudson is able to have complete control and then a, a very definite idea about what this is i imagine before going into it someone like todd hedo is i feel they they capture a certain a similar uncanniness in their aesthetic but it's it's more organic and sort of found and caught and leans more into the documentary than the studio so that's that's my um long-winded of say, uh, way of saying that that's my uh that's what i'm drawn to aesthetically well you said you know your your approach to nat naturalistic uh, way of lighting uh, differs or is there I guess you diverge away from it for a bit in white noise so let's jump into white noise like how did that happen or how did you diverge 
Well, uh, Noah, Noah had very early on, Noah Baumbach uh, had expressed that he, because, because White Noise is based on a Don DeLillo novel from 1985, he really felt that it should owe a debt um, and, and aesthetically be a, an homage in some respects to those films that existed at that time. So the films of... Um, uh, of uh, Adrian Lyne, for example, or, um, you know, Spielberg, um, going back to sort of Spielberg's work on, you know, his direction of um, uh, Close Encounters, for example. Um, but specifically, um, looking at the interiors, you know, Michael Mann movies, well, if you take a movie like Heat um, uh, or Manhunter, they, they, they have these kind of like um, stylized, uh, what we would term a sort of traditional Hollywood blue, you know. Um, so you'll have these night interiors and then this fairly unrealistic, strong blue light coming in and lighting the interiors. That's not how I would tend to have tradition, you know, like in my career have lit night scenes. I would tend to go more for the monochromatic. I would tend to, you know, if you have white, white um, drapes, uh, on a window, I would tend to sort of dull them down so they didn't sort of, if you hit them with light, they didn't just blow white and become unnaturally intense, you know? Whereas with white noise, uh, I really, you know, we decided to really lean into that aesthetic with the sort of, with the the idea of the blue light and the blue moonlight coming in, you know? So that is a, a, a deviation from a naturalistic, um, naturalistic type of moonlight you know well it's 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 interesting because like i think of noah bombach as such an iconic director in in a way like i know that he's he's very uh subtle in what he does but like um i don't know a film student who isn't aware of him type thing how what what would you say was his process and how did you work with him uh on this film uh well i i, I mean i think it's fair to say it's fair to say that that even though this film very much feels like a Noah Baumbach film, in in specifically sort of in its study of family and its mm -hmm. its its examination of um, uh, yeah, sort of family, you know, American American family dynamics. You know, it's it's a it's essentially about the Gladneys, which is Adam Adam Driver, Greta Gerwig playing the parents. Um, they have four children from other marriages. So, you know, certainly the first act, the first maybe 40 minutes of the film is very much a study of that. It's a, it's a sort of set, it's, you know, I should say it's a very, it's a, it's a satire. The movie is a satire on many things, sort of American consumption, academia, uh, suburban American life. Um, so, so those things I think will feel very familiar to fans of, of Noah's, previous films. However, this film really deviates. The second and the third act are really quite different, you know? Um, the second act is almost, uh, almost becomes a, um, like a sort of 70s or 80s sort of disaster movie in some ways, um, you know, with, a, with the family having to evade a toxic cloud. So this toxic cloud is sort of bubbling away in the, and boiling away in the sky like something out of the end of Ghostbusters, you know, um, sort of illuminated by its internal storm and the helicopter lights flashing on it. There's this strong overhead um, helicopter light that we wanted to employ over the Gladney's car that is very reminiscent of the of the car of the sorry of the light coming in on the truck at the beginning of Close Encounters, you know, um, where the where um, where the truck uh, the truck fails, you know. So it's it, you know, we we definitely sort of lent into that kind of feeling, you know. Um, and I, you know, um, it was very important that we shot on thirty five mil, and that was something that Netflix had given the blessing to uh, to Noah before I came on board. Um, Noah really wanted to shoot anamorphic because we felt that those movies of the eighties were always shot that way. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I honestly think that the film element, the shooting on film and um, anamorphic lenses really did a lot of the heavy lifting, you know, and then once you pair that with the terrific 
of set design, production design of of, of Jess uh, 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 Jess Goncha, then you know you have this. Um, you know, he created this wonderful, wonderful supermarket that is like a kind of uh, like a, the church, the modern sort of like American church. It's like this temple to consumption of just rows and rows of, you know, of um, of all these 80s products. I mean, it's fantastic. There's three very distinct scenes that taking place in there. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, that's kind of was the approach to the lighting in many ways, but also um, Noah had this idea that he really wanted the, the, the camera to sort of become untethered um, at a certain point in the film. Um, like, you know, literally to the point where, you know, at the beginning we're following Adam Driver's character, Jack Gladney, who um, is very sort of logical, you know, um, and deals with problems in a very sort of pragmatic manner. Then when he discovers that his wife has been having, having an affair and, and is sort of suffering, is sort of, sort of absolutely paralyzed by um, a fear of death, he, he sort of loses that logic and his emotions take over, at which point the camera literally sort of starts leaving him and becomes untethered and rotates around in the garage as he starts to sort of smash the garbage up and things. So Noah very much wanted to, to, to sort of explore this idea of the camera freeing itself and, and, and losing its kind of grounding at that point. What would you say was like a, a challenging scene for you in this movie to shoot, but you're really proud of the outcome? Um, well, there's two there's two specific sort of um, ep uh, sections of the film that I'm really proud of. The, the 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 first one is when the Gladneys leave the house. There's a a long sequence of them traveling in a station wagon. That's almost like a sort of um, uh, National Lampoon's um, kind of kind of station wagon. You know, it's like with the wood paneling down the side and um, you know. Um, the Griswold wagon and um, you know four four children in the car essentially three in the back one small child between the adults in the front seat so you know you've got uh, you've got essentially far, you know um, uh, you know sort of six occupants of this car and you're trying to shoot long scenes of them essentially stuck in traffic um, as they as they try to evade this toxic cloud and story-wise, they're on a two-lane highway, neck and neck with other cars, jostling as, as it's kind of bumper to bumper um, traffic jam, you know, but it's still also constantly moving. Um, now, that's a hard thing to film, firstly, because where do you put a camera when you've, you know, you've got five people in the car um, and how do you make it dynamic and how do you, you know, change the angles up? What we ultimately ended up doing was a mixture of different approaches. Um, we shot as little as possible actually on a real highway and we had to shoot, we had, you know, there was moments where they sort of come across accidents or other events on the road. Um, that necessitated us to actually be in that environment. Other times we had second unit shooting other sections, but the the vast majority of the actual driving was um once they once they hit the traffic through to the point where they arrive at the boy scout camp to spend the night all of that was done on a on a sound stage so essentially what we did was we we had the vehicle and we parked it as a static vehicle we had two other vehicles on the in the opposite lane but traveling uh, yeah, in, sorry, in the adjacent lane, but traveling in the same direction. Two other vehicles, and those vehicles were, were attached to metal cables with an electric um, lift at each end that the SFX team had set up. And those two cars on action were sort of dragged backwards and forwards. So in relation to a static hero car, it felt like the cars were moving. And then behind that, there was like an 80-foot by 20 foot high LED screen. So essentially we built a volume um, and on that screen was displayed 
array footage from six cameras um, that went out at night and shot, you know, the impression of a moving landscape. And I was very, very proud that we achieved that. I, 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 I'd worked a little bit on that kind of thing before, but only as sort of pickups on another movie. Um, so to be in a position of sort of being being pivotal in sort of con trying to convince everybody that this is the way we should do it, and then to finally for 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 Noah to come up to me at the end and tell and tell me that that was a hundred percent the way we sh we should have done it was very gratifying, and also it was another string to my bow, knowing that we've. We, we've been able to do that, you know, and, and I recognized, I think, early on that being, you know, um, young children, some young children and adults and even the adult actors in the car for long stretches on a on a road at night with all the mechanics of moving the car and lighting the car, it would have been a nightmare. And uh, Noah would have just... Um, he would have he would have just felt so compromised he would have felt so mm -hmm. frustrated trying to get the performances um you i recognized early on that you know i needed to help give noah the space give him the time with the actors have a controlled environment where he could just run and run and run and get the scene right not being constantly sort of interfered you know interrupted and interfered by the process of of working on a real road at night it would have been yeah, to be in a nightmare. Now, I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Oh my goodness! Uh, <laughs> well, I, um, if we're talking about guilt in television, one of my one of my guilts is that I don't watch enough television. I have to say, <laughs> it's not not quite a not quite a guilty pleasure. Um, um, I mean, I I don't know. I mean, I. I still enjoy going back to the films of my childhood. You know, um, I remember, you know, as a small child, I used to, when it was, whenever my birthday rolled around, I used to insist on either watching Life of, having a double bill of Life of Brian and uh, American Werewolf in London, you know. They're not, yeah. I mean, they're fine movies and they're not necessarily guilty pleasures, but they're, I don't think there's much in my work that, uh, you know, um, maybe Four Lions, which was the only comedy I've shot, which was <laughs> a jihadi suicide bombing comedy by Chris Morris. So that's <laughs> yeah, that really, uh, you know, it's pro it was potentially as controversial as Life of Brian was when it first came out. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, and and are you going to use the uh, song at the end there for your your, <laughs> your funeral? Because there was like a list of like the number one song in, <laughs> in, to yeah. have at a funeral or whatever, and it was listed I, as number one. I tell you what I would like was may, would maybe be that Eric Idle song about the universe, which I think yeah. is, pretty, which is pretty beautiful also. So, um, yeah, I think I've, yeah, that, that'd probably be my funeral song. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for letting me interview you today. All right. Thank you. I, I had a great time. It was uh, yeah, great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and that's it th for this week. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or of course, follow us on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. Today's episode of Filmmaker U is brought to you by our sponsors, OWC. Go to owcdigital.com for all your filmmaking and computer needs. And it's also brought to you by our other sponsors, AJA. Make sure to check out AJA.com so that you can see how they can help you in your post-production needs.